The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, and welcome to our November webinar, which focuses on charities and reporting to the ACNC. Today, we're going to look at what charities need to report to the ACNC and when. Uh, we'll also hope to clear up some confusion, clarify requirements for charities, uh, troubleshoot some of the tricky bits uh, of uh, reporting that charities had in the past. My name's Chris Richards. I'm from the ACNC's education team. Joining me to present today's webinar is Matt Crichton. Hello, Matt. Hello. Hello, everyone. As always, before we launch into the webinar proper, we've got a few quick little housekeeping points which we'll run through. If you've got any troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone. You can call the number listed in the email you'll have received when you registered for the webinar, put in the access code and listen to the webinar that way. You can ask a question at any time through the webinar by using the tools in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. We have a few colleagues ready to respond to any questions that come through. So that's Simon and Gulnar and Michael are going to help out today. So thank you to them. Uh, if your question isn't answered during the webinar, we will endeavour to get back to you uh, via email. Uh, we'll also allow time for a quick little bit of uh, Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you want to watch the presentation and save your questions for the end, that's fine. We're recording this webinar as well, as we do with all of our webinars. Uh, the recording as well as the transcript uh, and the slides that you'll see up on your screen, they'll be published on the ACNC website in the next couple of days. We'll also send out a follow-up email, as we usually do, to let you know uh, when things are available. Uh, the follow-up email will also have a whole heap of little links and stuff to uh, info on our website uh, that we mentioned throughout today's, today's presentation. Last thing, we value your feedback as always. So if you've got any uh, any ideas or any ways we can improve our webinars, let us know via the short survey at the end of today's session. So we're gonna launch in and we're gonna see what we're gonna cover today. There we go. Okay, we've got a few things to get through today. First, we'll have a look at um, reporting and record keeping. And I suppose the importance of record keeping in reporting and, and getting, reporting done well. Um, we'll look at the uh, charities ongoing reporting obligations to the ACNC too. So the things that charities have to tell us about, the things they have to submit, and then we'll get on to uh, possible other um, requirements charities may have for other regulators and what, what that means for reporting to the ACNC as well. So we've got a few things to get through, but I will um, move on the slide here and Chris, First up, can you just briefly take us through the importance of reporting? Indeed. Um, first thing, I guess, would be to clarify what we mean by the term reporting. Reporting in this webinar uh, refers to information that a charity has to give the ACNC uh, to meet its obligations as a charity. This ranges from notifications of, of certain details uh, to annual statements. Um, now, the importance of reporting, uh, there's a few reasons uh, why. First and foremost, it's a requirement of registration to report certain things to the ACNC. So in order to maintain charity registration, a charity has to report to the ACNC. In doing this, it can make fulfilling requirements to other regulators, state bodies, for example, uh, easier. In some cases, reporting to the ACNC alone can fulfil those other requirements as well. And we'll go into this uh, a little bit more later on. Um, other reasons why reporting is important. It can help your charity uphold good governance practices and stay on the right path. Uh, it helps your charity uh, keep stakeholders, be they members, supporters, donors, uh, informed of what you're doing and uh, how you are progressing in what you are doing. It's a good way to ensure transparency uh, as well. And reporting, um, for all the good it does and, and the ways it can help uh, with us or help us, is underpinned by record keeping, which is where our next couple of slides will will wander into. Okay. Yeah, as Chris mentioned, good record keeping really is a key component of reporting. So we're going to mention this a little bit uh, throughout the webinar today. It's Record keeping itself is not strictly reporting, um, but it, it, we want to emphasise the importance of how good record keeping can help you with reporting and make things easier. As it says on the slide here, without proper and adequate record keeping, a charity risks not being able to fulfil its uh, reporting obligations. Um, also, it just makes things, um, when, when you 
get to the point of having to report something, be it the annual information statement for the for the ACNC or notification of certain changes. If you've got really good record keeping practices in place, then it's easy to find the information you need and it makes the process of reporting so much quicker. You're not wasting your time Definitely. looking at things and, and trying to get the right information you need to do what you have to do. Yeah. So just setting this out from the beginning, good record keeping really is um, uh, the foundation for reporting. Um, record keeping though does form part of the obligations that a charity has for the ACNC. So, um, as part of registration with the ACNC as a charity, an organisation has to keep records and and uh, they cover operational records and financial records. And the requirements though do vary depending on the size, the activities and the complexity of, of the, of the organisation in question. The ACNC doesn't prescribe precisely how records must be kept. You can keep records in you know, a number of ways that may be suitable for your organisation, but there is the requirement to have records that clearly show the operational records and financial records that yeah. show the state of the, the charity. And just a few other points here on record keeping that's worth bearing in mind. It um, adds to transparency, transparency rather, and accountability. <laughs> Charity health, um, it helps cover decision decision making processes uh, and documents um, uh, how decisions are made uh, in an organisation, which again goes back to good governance and transparency. Um, it's a form of communication with stakeholders um, and ensures that they're kept in the loop about things. And again, comes back to uh, being able to prepare uh, prepare reports and 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 reporting. Um, now, just I guess very quickly too, uh, and there's a couple of very handy links there down the down the bottom of the uh, down the bottom of the page down the bottom of the screen there. Um, records can be kept in uh, paper form or in electronic form. Uh, they do need to be accessible and legible. Uh, they need to be in English or in a way that can be easily put into English. Um, but all of these things. You can keep them as a charity, hold on to them and keep them. You do not need to submit these records unless you are asked to do so. So have them, have them handy, have them uh, in a way, retain them, ensure that they're accessible to who needs them, but they don't need to be handed to us. Hold on to them and ensure that if sometime in the future we might come along asking for them, you've got them and you can easily find them. Okay, now let's get on to some reporting obligations, the things that you need to do as part of reporting to the ACNC. Just before we get to the, I suppose, the big, the main one of the annual information statement and all that entails, and we will get there. Yeah. Uh, Chris, can you just take us through the obligation to notify the yeah. ACNC of certain things? Yeah, now, um, yeah, there's a few things you've got to, uh, you've got to notify the ACNC as part of uh, if you're a charity. Um, the first one of those is uh, is the legal name. Um, your charity's legal name is its formal name as it appears on documents like your constitution or your rules or your certificate of incorporation. If your charity's legal name changes, you have to let us know. Yeah, and, and just on that, um, that's separate from maybe a, a business name or a trading name or a, a, um, a nickname yeah, uh, yeah. that the organisation may have, which it's also... Um, a good idea to notify us of changes to those because you want the public to know um, what your charity is called. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the legal name, that, that sort of formal official name as it appears on uh, official documents such as the ones Chris mentioned is the, the um, I suppose, uh, obligation that charities must notify the ACNC of if there are any changes to that. Um, the next one, as you can see there, is address for service. Now, address for service is the address where the ACNC will send a charity uh, or correspondence. Um, most commonly, it's an email address and a general email address uh, commonly as well. Um, we recommend, in fact, that charities do have an email address as their address for service. Yeah, I suppose the word address can mislead people in the yeah. that they have to put in a physical address for this, but really the address for service is just the, I suppose, the, the main official, for lack of a better term, contact point that you want the ACNC to send notifications and, and reminders and that sort of thing. So for most charities, an email address is the most convenient form of an address for service. And that's perfectly fine. As Chris said, we encourage an email address as the address for service. Um, but in doing that, it probably is 
good idea to have a general one, something like um, info at charity.org.au mm. or something like that, admin at charity.org, rather than the email address of a specific person because just in case someone leaves or, uh, you know, changes roles or whatever yeah, and, yeah. and you'd rather have um, these sorts of notifications going to an email address that other people can, can access. Of course, you can also list physical addresses with yeah. your charity's details. Um, but just this special one, this address for service is um, one I think you should uh, just think about as, as a different one that an email address is a good idea and it's the one uh, that you um, want the ACNC to communicate with your charity. So if that changes, you've got to let us know. If you don't let us know, apart from sort of that not being the right thing, we won't be able to get in touch with you. And if we can't get in touch with charities, that can cause some issues down the track. So best to keep that one up to date. Third one is um, any changes to responsible persons. Now, responsible persons being committee or board members or trustees. Um, if a charity has a, a change in a responsible person, if someone takes on a new role, finishes up as a role, swaps roles, um, you have to let us know. Uh, it's a good idea for a charity to have its own updated records listing responsible persons and their roles. Um, that way a charity can easily update uh, the listing of responsible persons that, that the ACNC has via the, our charity portal if and when that's needed. Yeah, and this is probably not going to happen all that often. The most common times is probably following an annual general meeting yeah. or maybe times throughout the year when a director or a committee member resigns from their position. But um, it, it is a requirement to notify the ACNC when it happens. It's not uh, one that you just wait until, say, the end of the year or whatever. As they happen, as the changes occur, then you have to log in and, and make those changes in the charity portal. Um, and the last bit of reporting relating to notifying the ACNC of changes um, is to your charity's governing document. Now, we need to know if charities make any changes to governing document, it's something like your constitution or your rules or your, your trustee, uh, whatever that governing document might be, might be called. As part of uh, this reporting, charities have to also pass on to the ACNC a copy of the new governing document. Um, again, this can be done through uh, the charity portal, uh, logging in, selecting the appropriate option when you when you get in there. This is similar to responsible persons, I suppose, in that mm. it's unlikely to change. Actually, it's much more unlikely to change than, say, the responsible persons a governing document is. So um, it, it's not one that you have to do too often, and it's most likely to come after a, a major meeting, like the annual general meeting or yeah. something, I suppose. But whenever it does happen, yeah, there is a requirement for a charity to notify the ACNC. Now, we've mentioned for all of these that there is the requirement to notify the ACNC of any changes. There are time limits within which this has to happen, Chris. Yes, there are, uh, as you can see up there on the screen. Once you're aware of any changes to any of those things that we've gone through, um, your charity has to tell the ACNC, has an obligation uh, to tell the ACNC, and the ACNC needs to know within 28 days of the changes, that's for medium and large charities, or 60 days for small charities. And just the, um, those size ah, categories yeah, there, yeah. that um, small charities is based on an organisation that has revenue um, up to uh, or less than $250,000 yeah. per year, annual revenue. And medium is 250000 and above, up to uh, a million. And then a large is a million dollars of annual revenue and above. Yes. So three tiers there. The larger ones have to notify us of these changes within a shorter time frame. Now on to the annual information statement. This is sort of the biggie. And yes. um, we'll go into this in a a fair bit more detail, but following notification of certain changes, this is the one we thought that um, lots of people would get the most uh, use out of. So, Chris, this is something that um, all charities have to submit to the ACNC. Indeed, uh, and for a number of charities, the the due dates and bits and pieces might be coming up in the uh, in the next uh, little while. So, um, this is probably pretty timely. Um, the annual information statement is a statement that provides a, a bit of a snapshot 
of your charity um, over its previous sort of 12 months, I guess. Uh, yeah, and it's the big one. It's the one that charities have to do each year. Okay, the, just on, Chris mentioned the due dates. It's, it will come up soon for some. Yeah. It, there isn't a uniform due date for everybody on this one. It's due within six months of the end of a charity's reporting period. So that will differ depending on the um, the dates to which a charity reports internally, that is. So for a lot of charities, it will be coming up soon, but for others, it won't be due until later next year. And we've got some info, again, through uh, through bits and pieces on our site um, that gives a bit of a rundown on, on due dates and details and things like that. So if you're unsure, go and have a, go and have a look. Um, now it's it's important to to remember too that information in the AIS is published on the ACNC charity register in in different places, but not all information is published on the register. Um, for example, personal details of responsible persons uh, are not published on the register. But a summary of the annual information statement from from a charity is uh, as are financial figures, um, beneficiaries, and charity contact details. Uh, to get a good look or a good idea of how this looks on the register, it's worth um, having a look at your charity's page uh, on, on the register or even having a bit of a look at, at, say, the pages of other charities as well. That'll give you a bit of an idea of how things how things appear online. Yeah, it's a, a good thing to keep in mind when you're filling this out because the charity register is a great place for people, um, just members of the general public, I mean, to find information about charities. So making sure that you're filling in the annual information statement fully and properly is a way to ensure that the public are seeing the right information about your charity when, when they look it up. Now, um, we'll get into the details of the annual information statement itself in that, you know, the things that you have to provide and fill in. Yeah. So we'll go through this, um, I suppose, section by section. So Chris, as a way of helping people prepare um, for doing the annual information statement, what does it ask? Okay, um, it's got a number of sections and each of those sections asks a different sort of series or set of questions. First thing it goes through are some of the basic details of, uh, of your charity. Um, it's, that's usually a good place to start. Things like contact details, um, web address, uh, size. Um, this, this is the point also where there are some questions uh, often about um, whether the charity is uh, is incorporated, um, if whether it's an incorporated association, um, this bit near the start also has a spot for uh, details about fundraising uh, and fundraising licences uh, too. So it's important to note also here that that responding to the questions on incorporated associations and fundraising, this helps the ACNC improve reporting to government agencies for charities. And it may be that some of these questions aren't um, relevant to your organisation. Yeah, yeah. So you may have to answer no if, you, if you're not an incorporated association or don't have any fundraising licences and that sort of thing. Um, but, of course, there's an option to do that yep. there. Um, and the next bit? There's, uh, the next bit looks at the charity's work, its operations, uh, those sorts of things. So we ask you to provide information about your charity's activities, which, you know, what its main activities are. Uh, as well as some of the other activities that you might undertake. Um, it also asks about the locations of your work too. Um, after that, it asks you, the AIS asks you, to provide details about your charity's beneficiaries. Now, that is the people who your charity helps or sets out to help. Yeah, and when we say the details of beneficiaries, we don't mean individual details of individual <laughs> people. We're just talking about broad categories of the people that your charity works to help. So um, the, the form will have uh, yeah, tick boxes of broad categories rather mm -hmm. than, say, free text fields where you, where you type in um, every, every group or every individual. That, that's not the case. It's, it's broad-based categories of the types of people that um, your work helps out. And in doing that, just try and think carefully about it and choose the ones that most accurately reflect the, the work that your charity does. Yeah. Um, the next bit after that looks at information or, or concentrates on information about charity, um, cha your charity's people, I guess, it's human resources, um, employees and, and volunteers. This is where having some of your documentation, some of your records 
at hand might be very helpful. If your charity has employees or volunteers, um, have your records ready. Uh, they might be things like just straight up numbers or they might be you know, your PAYG um, documentation as well. Yeah, this, this point is, is more about the numbers of yeah, employees yeah. and volunteers. It's not about, again, the individual details of who <laughs> your employees are or anything like that. It's just um, just a sheer count of, of numbers of volunteers. Now, um, after these categories, we get into the finances and the financial side of things. Um, the first thing to note here is that the requirements when it comes to reporting on finances uh, differ depending on charity size. As you can see on the screen, your medium and large charities must provide a financial report with the annual information statement. Small charities don't have to, but we do encourage it, again, for transparency and, and good governance and that sort of stuff. Um, they, these financial reports uh, are in addition to the financial questions mm. that are within the annual information statement. I suppose once you get into it, this will become clear, but the annual information statement asks a series of questions about finances and then for medium and large charities there is a requirement to provide uh, a document, upload a document of a yes. financial a financial report and that's what we're, we're talking about here. And just on that, Chris did mention it's um, mandatory, was the screen says it's compulsory for medium and large charities. Within that requirement, large charities must have their um, financial statements audited and medium-sized charities can have it either reviewed or audited. So there is a requirement um, for reviewing and auditing this as well. But as we said, for small charities, it's it's optional. So um, that requirement doesn't apply to small charities. Now, um, as Matt mentioned, um, questions around here in addition to anything you might have to send us, there are questions around financial information. Um, basically, information that, that makes up an income statement uh, and, and a balance sheet. Again, the level of detail here, I guess, depends on whether your charity is small or medium or large. Um, now, when, rather than go through each piece of information here, the annual information statement guide, and there's a link for it there down the bottom, um, will tell you what you need to know, the information you need to have at hand and what you need to actually you know, fill in depending on the size of your charity. Yeah, the guide spells out these questions one by one. So yeah. it's not just a vague guide that gives you an idea of, of what might be there and you have to guess. It actually lists them, you know, a, everything, a everything that you, yeah. you need. So, um, yeah, as, as Chris said, rather than go into the details here, it really is worth going to that part of the website as the address down the bottom of the screen shows, acnc.gov.au forward slash 2019 AIS guide. That'll take you to a, a full comprehensive guide of the entire AIS. And then within there, scroll down a little bit, you'll find the section on uh, financial questions. And that'll tell you all the information that the form will ask in the order that it asks it. Yep. Okay. And here we've just got a... Um, Little quote that uh, provides, I suppose, a little reassurance about doing the AIS if anyone was potentially getting overwhelmed at the thought <laughs> of all of this. Most yeah. charities already collect the information we ask for in the annual information statement. And often this is information gathered for their members, funders, boards, or, or to include in charities annual reports. So you're likely to have all of this. It's not going to be anything new. It's just a matter of uh, making sure you've got access to it at the right time to be able to fill it in. And again, this also emphasises the importance of good record keeping as well. If you've already got all this information, you've kept your records well, filling in your AIS is far, far easier. Um, so again, good record keeping makes reporting easier. Okay, now we'll just get into uh, some of the things that you'll need to help you get through this, or do it, do it properly and yeah. as easily as possible. Chris, can you take us through some of the things that people should have on hand when, they, when they're filling um, this? The first thing you'll need to do is to ensure that you actually have your reporting, your charity's reporting is up to date. Now, if you've reported and done your AISs all the way up through all your previous years, you can just jump in and do the one that's required, the latest one, and get it done. If you are needing to do one from a previous year, you need to do that before you jump in and do the most recent one. So confirm that your charity's reporting is up to date and confirm what you may need to do to either bring it up to date or catch up or, or whatever. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, the first thing to do. You can't begin your 2019 AIS until you've completed ones from previous years. Yeah, and if, 
if you haven't completed ones from previous years, I mean, most charities will have, mm. so it's not going to be an issue for most charities. But if you haven't, um, that, that is a, a failing of, to meet obligations to the agency. You have to report one of these every year. So it would be something that you get onto very quickly to, to ensure that your obligations as a registered charity are being met and um, you don't uh, fall foul of that and yeah. potentially the, the ramifications of failing to meet obligations are that, um, well, I mean, ultimately down the track, it, it could lead to uh, a loss of registration as a charity. So make sure the reporting is up to date. That would be the first thing. Yeah. The next bit? Um, you've got to make sure that your charity uh, has the correct reporting period um, you know, uh, listed. So confirm your charity's reporting period, that period of dates in which you are reporting on for your AIS. Um, obviously, the most common one is the financial year, so July to June. But there are plenty of charities that report to a calendar year, and there are even some charities that report to different years, maybe based on the fact that they might be linked to an overseas organisation that reports on a different year. So this also, depending on when your reporting period is, it affects the due date of your information or your annual information statement. So um, just take note of that and make sure you've got that one right. The last little thing we mentioned here is size too. Um, while lots of charities remain in the same size bracket every year, there might be some that might shift up or shift down. Uh, a so it might go from small to medium or medium back to small or, or whichever. So make sure you know which size your charity will report as because there are different uh, levels of detail and different levels of reporting requirement depending on your size. Yeah, we, we won't go into the details of calculating this here, but size, as I briefly mentioned before when we went through the tiered, uh, the three tiers, it's determined by revenue. Um, so if, you, if you're not sure and your charity is one that maybe sits on that borderline between a couple of categories, have a look at um, a fact sheet we've got on our website. We'll include it in the follow-up email that yeah. we send to you. But if you wanted to have a look at that now, um, charity size on the ACNC website, if you search charity size, you'll find a fact sheet that helps you figure out um, how to calculate uh, your charity size. Yeah. Um, obviously, to do your AIS, you're going to need your charity portal login details. Um, it will be an email address that you use to sign up and it will also be your own password. Now, if you've forgotten your password, you can have it reset at the login screen. Same sort of procedure that a lot of password reset things go through. Um, so don't worry about that. If you're having trouble remembering it, I'm sure we've all had trouble remembering our password it's somewhere along the line, you can reset it if required. Um, once upon a time, we used to have set logins yes. for charities, and in many cases, charities would have to share this amongst the people in the charity to be able to log in and do things for that charity. Um, since we set up a new charity portal in a new system uh, late last year, about a year ago, mm. um, individuals have login details using an email address now. So it might be that... Um, some individuals within your charity already have login details. They've already logged in and, and set themselves up. You might not. Um, it, it's easy enough to do. You can you can um, set up an account to be able to log in and then have access to the charity to to uh, fill in the forms that it needs to do. So it's likely to be an email address that you personally set up for yourself for the charity portal. Yeah. Um, another thing you'll most likely need are project reports. Now, when we mention or talk about project reports, they're the sorts of things that, you know, they might get presented to a, a meeting or something like that of, of your charity, um, a bit of an update as to how one of your key projects is going. Um, it will probably contain a bit of information about the project itself, uh, which covers things like your charity's activities, um, who that project sets out to benefit, so beneficiaries. Um, you know, there, there might be a little bit of information there about employees uh, and other details as well. Uh, as well. Um, and we mentioned this uh, a moment or two ago, um, PAYG, PAYGCO, payment summaries, they can be invaluable when it comes to having information at hand about employee numbers and, and that sort of thing. So again, we go back to record keeping um, and documentation and things like that. If you're keeping up to date with your project reports, if you're regularly reporting back to meetings or, or reporting even back to members and things like that about what you're doing, um, it will be far easier for you to be able to draw on this information when you go through and do your AIS.
Okay, and a few other things. Funder and donor reports, if you have them, they can be useful. Grant acquittal reports, of course, not all organisations can yeah. have these sorts of things, but again, they can be useful in providing information that we ask for. And an annual report. Well, you don't have to submit an annual report as part of the annual information statement. It's different to a financial report, of course, but we don't have to submit an annual report, um, but it can provide um, much of the information that the AIS covers. Yeah. Okay. And this last bit, Chris. Um, yeah, we've we've touched on this just uh, earlier on too. Um, incorporated association uh, numbers and fundraising license uh, numbers. Um, you, if you are fundraising in a certain state or territory in Australia, or if you are an incorporated association, you will have a number, and we do ask for that uh, that information. And uh, oh, what was the other thing that was? Uh, oh yes, membership and AGM details <laughs> is the, is the other one as well. Um, that will be handy to have so that you can refer to it too. Okay, we did touch on finances before, and as we said, have a look at the AIS guide on the website because it does lay out each um, thing that's required in the financial questions. Mm. But as far as the um, upload of the document, the financial report that some charities must do. We'll touch on a, a bit of the requirements here. So for example, um, a balance sheet statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income. Again, if uh, many charities will already have this, it's not yes. as if this is going to impose a new obligation on organisations. It's just the things that you have to include in the financial statements you upload. Um, again, it's compulsory for medium and large charities and they have to meet certain accounting standards. Now, we it would be a bit much of a detour to go into the details of Australian accounting standards now. So we've got a, a list here that, um, sorry, a link here that provides a checklist which does have information about that. Yeah. So if you wanted to have a look at that, um, go there, acnc.gov.au forward slash 2019 AIS checklist, and that'll give you an overview of exactly what's involved. Okay, now we'll, Touch on other regulators, uh, yeah. Chris. So uh, charities are in a position where there may be, there's the ACNC to report to, of course, but there may be, depending on their circumstances, other regulators. Yeah. And that's worth keeping in mind. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, you've got to think a little bit beyond just reporting to the ACNC. Um, there may be other regulators, particularly other government regulators, uh, that you might have reporting obligations to. Um, now, these obligations might be based on your charity's location, um, your, your legal structure, perhaps, um, the type of organisation you are, uh, your fundraising status, whether you go out and fundraise or not, uh, or the types of tax benefits that you receive. So there's some of the things that you should think about. There's some of the things that might uh, influence or might, you know, uh, see you having to report to other regulators. Again, down the bottom of the screen there, we've got a, a lovely little link that'll uh, take you to a spot on our website where we will go through some of those other regulators that you may have obligations to. Yeah, and um, this, I mean, this may sound obvious, but I think it's worth reiterating. This isn't uniform. This is going yeah. to be different for different organisations. So an organisation that's set up for, say, um, education purposes may have obligations to um, agencies or, or regulators um, focused on education, whereas others might not, of course. So it's not uniform. It depends on what your organisation does. It's worth um, making sure you're aware of the other other obligations you have to other regulators. Mm. This table here is taken from our website, and I know it's not a great size and it's not <laughs> that easy to, to look at in detail here, but you can see the link there on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen is where you'll find this table. This is uh, a bit of an overview of certain... Um, government regulators, we can see here asset companies, ORIC, Indigenous Corporations, Ancillary Funds, and then state-based incorporating bodies, and the different requirements that these agencies have and how they compare to the what's required of the ACNC. So you'll see the things that, I suppose this is based on our uh, work in trying to reduce red tape for charities and yeah. streamline reporting requirements. This gives you a, a bit of a progress report of what you need to do for which agency and um, it's worth having a look at that and seeing how it applies to your particular organisation. So again, that link down in the bottom right hand corner is where you'll find it and that way you can go into more depth on the bits that apply to your organisation specifically. Now, reporting for incorporated associations um, 
that will vary as was probably indicated in the table on the previous screen there. Uh, that will vary depending on reporting arrangements. If your charity is fundraising as well, it is likely to have reporting obligations to state or to territory regulators. Now, often these regulators are things like, say, fair trading or what's, what's the name of some of the other ones that we, we have? Um, yeah, the, it's Consumer Affairs consumer in Victoria. Affairs, it's, yeah. I think, uh, Consumer Business Services in South Australia, yeah. possibly. So different names in different states. Um, I mean, if you've got any doubts or any questions about that, um, we've got, again, uh, I think we've got a whole rundown of the of the various uh, state and territory relevant um, sort of uh, regulators on, on the ACNC website. We'll include that link in the email that we send out after, after we're done here. And it's important to know here that these state-based regulators will all have their own requirements of charities too. So if you happen to say fundraise in Queensland and New South Wales and you've got obligations to agencies in both of those states, those obligations to those agencies aren't going to be exactly the same. So it will depend on what's required in New South Wales and what's required in Queensland and what's required in Victoria. So it's worth um, keeping on top of that and knowing what you have to report to each state. Yeah. Now, again, we'll, we, we've done it a few times. We're going to come back to record keeping again. Um, your record keeping will help your charity meet reporting obligations. Um, good record keeping can help you with all your reporting obligations to the ACNC and, and I guess further than that to, to other government uh, uh, regulators or, or other agencies. Um, solid record keeping practices lead to good reporting. Uh, and it's important to know what obligations your charity has to other agencies as well. Yeah, that, that bit involves a really important one. You, ne you need to know. And if you know, the things become easier when you've got a few different agencies to yeah. report to. Just a few links here that may help you out. Again, we'll include these in the follow-up email that goes after the webinar is finished. But other regulators, red tape reduction, that provides some information about how we're working to reduce red tape for charities in reporting um, across different government agencies. Transitional reporting, some information about uh, reporting to different government agencies. It, it, it's likely to apply to only certain organisations. Yeah, yeah. And then some information about what's required of certain states and territories there at the fourth I link. I think that fourth link might also have that list of um, oh, okay. who, who the regulators are yep. as well. Don't don't quote me on that, please, but that okay. might be the case. <laughs> you know, we'll, just, we'll finish up with some tips to remember to make reporting to the ACNC, and for that matter, other agencies if possible, um, to make it easier. Mm. Um, we'll go through these. We've got a few tips to take down here, so we'll go through them one by one. Chris, how about the first couple? Um, look, keeping good financial and operational records is, is a key, just a key step, full stop. Um, again, good record keeping equals or can lead to or should lead to good reporting. Um, part of good record keeping is to have a good record keeping policy that would cover um, the documents that you need to keep, uh, financial, operational, the method or the, the way they are kept, uh, and also who has responsibility for keeping those documents and who might have responsibility for ensuring that the documents are stored in a certain spot and are safe and aren't going to get uh, misused, misplaced, ruined, whatever. There are a couple more here. So make sure you check your charity's financial year end date. As we said, it's really common to, for charities to report on a financial year, the July to June financial year. It's also common for some to have a calendar year reporting period. And then, as Chris mentioned earlier, there may be different reporting years with, um, outside of those two as well. So make sure you've got the right reporting period. And the second point here, check some of these details. Check your charity's address for service. Mm. Is it still the appropriate email address? Should it be made someone else's? Details of responsible persons too. Is the listing of the people as your board or, or committee um, still up to date? Is it still yeah. accurate? And, and make the necessary changes to those. Um, your charity should have financial information on hand before you start your AIS. Um, don't dive in without having all the material you need. Um, it's far better to have it there handy and ready to go so that you can uh, that you can use it when required. Um, and just a, a general sort of, I guess, good practice point here is to save your AIS as you go uh, and to review it um, before submitting it as well. 
Actually, this may sound um, really obvious, yeah. but it's worth making the point because we've had in um, reports of people uh, thinking they've completed the annual information statement, but they they'd done a review or they they um, downloaded the document to have a look at it and then forgot to actually hit submit at the end. So um, make sure that you've yeah you're saving it as you go. When you review it, you can review the document, but make sure you actually submit it to at the end. We've had instances where people think they have, yeah. they haven't, and they've um, gotten in a bit of strife later on. So um, so make sure you, you do follow that. There's a couple more here. Ensure that you know the other regulators your charity needs to report to, as we just mentioned. There yeah. may be state-based regulators. There may be other uh, Commonwealth regulators or uh, sector-specific regulators, whether that be for education or health or whatever it may be. So make sure you know what what's required of those, uh, by those regulators or agencies and uh, check whether or not uh, it's, they require the same thing as the AS or whether, sorry, the ACNC or whether or not reporting to the ACNC may in fact cover some of the requirements yeah. for other organisations. Oh, hello, here we are. We've gotten to a point where we're going to answer a couple of questions. So we've had some questions come through, thanks to our friendly trio here who are answering questions in the background and typing away. Um, so thank you for that. First question, and it's one that was sort of looked at in passing through a couple of those tables and a couple of the slides. Um, the differences and, and also, I guess, the similarities between the obligations for companies that might be under the Corporations Act and charities that are under the ACNC? Um, yeah, there, there may be a few. It's a good question. There, there's, in one respect, there's there's a short answer and then there's also a longer answer. <laughs> um, for brevity, we'll go with the short answer, but um, there is lots of information on their website that can out outline this in, in more detail. Uh, companies limited by guarantees are type of legal structure and they're likely to have obligations to ASIC. Uh, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. Now, for, for many of these, there uh, what used to be required of companies reporting to ASIC may no longer be required. Mm. The uh, reporting to the ACNC has taken over some of these requirements, which now is a little bit um, old news, I suppose. Yeah. The ACNC has been around for seven years, so many charities have gotten used to this. But most things uh, require just reporting to the ACNC. There are a couple of uh, I suppose, um, specific details regarding uh, charity names and, and possibly member duties that ASIC still may need to know about, but it's worth checking. We do have a complete fact sheet guide of, for companies limited by guarantee on our website at acnc.gov.au forward slash CLG. There you go. Companies limited by guarantee, CLG. Mm. Have a look there. It'll provide a comprehensive overview of what's required and explain what is no longer required in reporting to ASIC now that the ACNC is um, about and charities are reporting to the ACNC. Um, oh, here, one here that's actually touched on something that we, we just covered as well about um, reviewing uh, responses in your AIS before submission. Um, how do you do it? Can it be done? Yes, it can be done. There you go. Um, charities definitely have um, the chance to review um, their answers or their responses in the AIS before they submit it. Um, you can fill in your AIS and near the end of the form, the online form obviously, um, you're given the option to review or, or preview um, your completed AIS before you submit it. Um, there's a big button on the, on the screen that you'll see when you get to that point near the end of uh, your AIS, um, and it's review and submit. Um, so if you're in that section, the big button says preview your charity's AIS. And simply you click on it, you'll be able to have a look at your answers, have a look at your responses to the questions, uh, print it out um, as far as I understand as well, and have that bit of documentation there so that you can double and triple check if you need to go and check with someone about an answer. Uh, you can do that uh, and your AIS will still be saved and still be ready to go. And once you've gotten all that stuff, if you need to modify anything, you can go back into the form and do it and then you can submit it to us and, and do that rather easily. So that's definitely an option. And look, again, once you've reviewed it or, or whatever, make sure you hit submit, don't leave it sort of hanging. Uh, make sure you hit submit so we get it. 
There's a question about group reporting, and I think um, this may be relevant for some organisations. Maybe your charity is part of a, a collection of many others that work under the um, under a peak body or something like that. So the ACNC does have an option for organisations to submit an AIS as part of a group or or as part of joint reporting. Yeah. Um, on that though, that the first thing to mention is that you have to have applied for this and, and been approved to be able to do so and there are certain conditions on reporting. So if you think your charity is one that may be, uh, that, that could benefit from group reporting because there are other organisations that you work closely with and, it, and it's likely to benefit uh, your organisation in reporting to do so, please apply uh, for group reporting or, or to report jointly and then we can consider that and that can be another way to complete the annual information statement. Now that's a little bit different because that's done via a that's done by a, oops, something pop up there on the screen. We'll skip the other screen back. It's interesting. Yeah, oh, well, sorry about that. Um, that's done via a spreadsheet that's designed specifically for that type of reporting. So if you're thinking about group reporting, get in touch with us and we'll mm. be able to work that out with you. Um, I reckon that might just be about, about done. Uh, it's probably, it's lunchtime in many parts of the country and for other parts of the country, it's probably coffee break time. So. We might wander off. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for your for your time and and for attending and uh, all that sort of stuff. As you can see up on the screen, we have a number of ways that you can uh, stay in touch with us. Um, there's a link there. Yes, there is acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars. What, that's where all our webinars are available. That's where this one, recording of this one will appear. That's where all of our past ones are uh, hanging out. So if you want to go and have a look at some of our past webinars, go have a look. Um, We've had some pretty well attended ones this year too, so um, that's that's been excellent. If you need to contact our advice services team, it's pretty easy to do. They're available by phone uh, from nine till five, Monday to Friday. That's Melbourne time, so um, just make sure that you know that. You can email them as well. Um, there's an online inquiry form on the contact us page on our website. Um, just before we finish, uh, if you've got a few seconds after we're done here, there'll be a little survey that pops up at the end of the webinar. It's three quick questions. It'll probably take you about a minute, maybe not even. Um, we would really appreciate your feedback if you're able to uh, just take the time to answer a couple of those questions. Um, and last up too, this is our last webinar for 2019. So we want to thank everyone who has registered uh, for webinars this year, who has attended webinars or who has watched a recording of uh, our webinars as well. Um, it's greatly appreciated. Your support and your feedback are, uh, are always uh, greatly appreciated. And we will be back in 2020 with further webinars and further bits and pieces. So thank you very much. Um, again, keep an eye on the website, acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars. We will confirm our webinar schedule um, for the beginning of 2020 in the next little bit. So if you're interested in attending uh, or registering, uh, keep an eye on that part of the website and uh, we'll keep it updated. Um, beyond that, I reckon we're done. Thanks to all the people answering the questions in the other, in the other area. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. And we will let you go. See you soon. Thanks, everybody.